Back on the Young Turks. Now uh, we're going to go to a little bit of foreign policy for you guys. We're going to talk to Sasha Poliko Saransky, senior editor at Foreign Affairs, and he's also the author of The Unspoken Alliance Israel's Secret Relationship with Apartheid South Africa. Interesting. Uh, Sasha, welcome to the Young Turks. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. First, let's start with this. What is the Goldstone Report? Well, the Goldstone Report is a UN document uh, that details the events that took place during the Israeli incursion in Gaza at the end of 2008 and in early 2009, and it's turned into a massive controversy over the past few months because many in Israel and many Israeli uh, pro-Israel uh, people in the United States see it. Uh, as an attack on Israel's legitimacy. And so what we're seeing now is a character attack on the man who was in charge of the report, who is a South African Jewish judge named Richard Goldstone, which brings us to the article that I wrote today. Yes, but first, what's in the Goldstone report that uh, people are so worried about? Well, it's complicated, but to put it simply, I would say that people feel that it has unfairly targeted Israel based on its uh, invasion of Gaza, which many Israelis would argue was done for security purposes. And the Goldstone Report essentially accuses Israel of committing war crimes during its incursion into Gaza. And is, the Goldstone Report is very critical of what the Israeli army did in Gaza. Um, and as you know, there was a lot of destruction. There were a lot of civilians killed. And the charge that the Israeli Defense Forces committed war crimes has really angered people, uh, both in Israel and uh, in the pro-Israel community across the so world. Do they, so did they attack Goldstone for, uh, for saying that by saying, well, it's not true, we didn't kill civilians, there were not disproportionate responses, or, yeah, hell yeah, we did that, but you know what, Goldstone's a bad guy? <laughs> well, I would put it somewhere in between, Jenk. I mean... Uh, most of the responses that I've seen uh, would argue that uh, the, the level of violence was necessary given the way that the Hamas fighters were positioned in Gaza. So Israelis will argue that, oh, people were used as human shields, so yes, we destroyed an entire apartment building, but that's because there were some people with guns on the roof or there were Hamas fighters hiding inside, and therefore uh, it's justified. And the Goldstone Report found that some of these things were, were war crimes, in, in the opinion of, of Goldstone, and that is what has really set people off in Israel, because they think that Goldstone and his report seek to delegitimize the state of Israel and prevent it from defending itself under any circumstances. Well, you, you can't call Richard Goldstone anti-Semitic. He's Jewish. So right. uh, he, we have to... Uh, delegitimize them in some other way. So uh, what is that way that they have chosen? Well, there have been lots of different ways, but the latest is to attack him for his record as a judge under the old apartheid government in South Africa during the 1980s. And this is a particularly hypocritical attack, in my opinion, because as I argued in my Huffington Post piece today and in my book, the Israeli government was actually the most significant arms supplier to the old South African apartheid regime during the late 1970s and the early 1980s. So for them, of all people, Israeli government officials, to accuse Goldstone of having worked for an unjust racist regime seems to me the height of hypocrisy. But Be before we go to Israel's uh, ties with the apartheid government of South Africa, uh, what did, you know, if Goldstone worked with the old government, then uh, obviously Nelson Mandela uh, must have uh, been irate about that and probably hates the guy, right? No, not at all. I mean, actually, Jenk, what happened is during the transition years in South Africa, the early 1990s, after Mandela was let out of prison, but before the 1994 elections, Goldstone chaired a very important commission on public violence. And his findings in that commission actually, in my opinion, helped pave the way for a peaceful transition and avert a civil war scenario in South Africa, which many people in the early 1990s feared might happen. And essentially what Goldstone's commission back then 
1991, 92, 93 found was that the apartheid regime's security forces were actually acting as a so-called covert third force and fomenting violence between uh, different black groups in South Africa in an effort to undermine the election. And so what he found back then was actually quite important in paving the way for a peaceful transfer of power. And so when Mandela was elected president in 1994, he actually embraced Goldstone and appointed him to the Constitutional Court, which is South Africa's equivalent of the Supreme Court. Uh, and Goldstone's career from that point on included various uh, important positions within the UN, including the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal uh, and others. So now let's get to the heart of your book, The Unspoken Alliance, Israel's sure. Secret Relationship with Apartheid South Africa. And I did not know very much about it until I was uh, reading up on some of the stuff that uh, you had written. Uh, how deep was that relationship? Well, it was very deep, Cenk. Uh, it started out um, as actually a, a sort of hostile relationship. In the 1960s, Israel was actually very critical of the apartheid regime in South Africa and took a strong moral stand against it, denounced it as, as racist at every possible opportunity. But by the early 1970s, for a variety of reasons, including uh, various African states allying with Israel's Arab enemies, Israel started to move towards South Africa. And after the Yom Kippur War in 1973, they essentially got in bed with the apartheid regime. And from that point forward, arms sales increased. And by the mid-1980s, after some other countries, including the United States, had stopped selling arms to South Africa, Israel was really the most significant and important supplier. And what I try to do in this book, uh, partially for personal reasons, because my parents are both South African and I'm Jewish, is to try and understand how a nation of refugees and Holocaust survivors got into bed with a white supremacist regime, guys who had enthusiastically supported Hitler during World War II. It seems like the ultimate paradox, and so that's the question that I really open the book with. S Sasha, that's a great, great question. I mean, you've got so many details on how they work together that's so disturbing, uh, but uh, uh, that was the heart of where I wanted to go. Sure. Why do you think they did it? I mean, what, what, how, that's an enormous turnaround that y you would have imagined would be unconscionable. So w why did they do it? Well, for one thing, we're in the middle of the Cold War during this period, so you have to take that into account. South Africa is fighting Soviet and Cuban-funded uh, enemies on its borders. Their uh, fear was that there was going to be a communist takeover from within and without. Uh, it was uh, overstated and paranoid, in my opinion, but there was a real war going on uh, on South Africa's borders, so you have to take that into account. And Israel ha has always faced uh, you know, enemies on its borders and attacks from the UN, uh, and that's part of why people are so angry at Goldstone today because they see that as part of the same pattern. But what happened between these two countries essentially is that at first it was an extremely beneficial economic relationship for Israel because Israel needed export markets for its arms industry, which is very important to the Israeli economy. And South Africa needed arms because it couldn't get them anywhere. And uh, that problem got even more acute for the South Africans in the early 80s because there was a mandatory UN embargo. And pretty much everyone observed it except Israel. And so that's when Israel became an essential link. Uh, so for economic reasons, one. And secondly, there was an ideological element to this, too. And that's not to say that everyone in Israel thought the South African apartheid regime was great. I don't argue that by any means, but there were certain leading generals in the Israeli military and certain politicians on the right wing of the political spectrum, especially in the Likud party, who formed close relationships with various leading officials in the apartheid regime. And all of this is documented in my book through correspondence between people like Ariel Sharon and his counterparts in the South African military. And essentially, these guys were saying to each other in letters that we're fighting the same communist enemy who wants to push us into the sea. And they saw Nelson Mandela and Yasser Arafat as two sides of the same coin. And they thought that their struggle was a common fight. And so it was also defined uh, as sort of a, a common battle during the 1980s. And, and, you know, we're very short on time here, but obviously it had nothing to do with communism. I'm sure at the time that they deluded themselves into thinking that it did, 
but the real similarity was they had this bothersome problem of a significant minority that they just didn't have any interest in giving any power to. Yeah, well, that's part of it, too. And, I mean, this is a more difficult question because it's harder to document. But there were definitely certain people on the right wing in Israel who were interested in the way that South Africa was dealing with its internal problem. Uh, Ariel Sharon was one of these, and I talk about that a little bit in the book, and there's some other journalists who've written about it over the years. Uh, but primarily what I focus on is the military relationship and also cooperation in the nuclear sphere, because both of these countries were developing nuclear weapons, and people tend to forget it, but South Africa was actually a nuclear power and built nuclear bombs during the 1970s and 80s, and Israel was involved with that effort, and South Africa was also involved in selling uranium to Israel, which helped the Israeli nuclear program. Uh, you look, this is how you lose your soul, not by bad intentions, but by good intentions. People think uh, we've got to defend Israel by any means necessary. And once you start going down that road, that's an ugly, ugly road. And, you know, I, Israel got rescued on that front because South African government got toppled. So, but, uh, you know, we, now everybody wishes they hadn't gone down that road, but that's what happens when you give in to the right-wingers in your own government who want to push you in that direction. I, I hope that Israel doesn't continue to make that mistake in the, you know, in its current government. But yeah, it looks I, like so I would, they are. I, I, I would agree with you, but I'm not so sure that's what's going to happen. I mean, if you take what, what's happened with this most recent Goldstone uproar, you know, they're basically attacking him uh, for, for his record back in the day when, in fact, they were doing something much, much more important, much, much worse to, to support the government uh, in South Africa. So... I think that what you're seeing is uh, trying to discredit Goldstone by any means necessary because certain people in Israel and the current government really see him and his re report as a threat to Israel. And I think uh, that's overstated. Like I said in the article, I think there's some legitimate criticisms of the report, and that's a debate worth having. But the campaign of character assassination that they've been pursuing for the last week is utterly ridiculous in light of the history. All right. Sasha Polakov, Saransky, author of The Unspoken Alliance, Israel's Secret Relationship with Apartheid South Africa. Thank you for joining us on The Young Turks. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you.